old age again strikes again. Okay, everybody, that's old age. That's what that is. I'm doing everything remote, so uh, try not to expect the absolute greatest. Trying to get there. Okay, you guys should have me on Mixler and uh, Channel 6 and three other ones, which are device-specific. By the way, if you have specific devices, the other channels are available. But they do look to see what device you have first. Today was a challenge. It was. It was very challenging. Do you guys know that with this hurricane, it was the most interesting setup I've ever seen in my lifetime? Now, number one, it was a group of high-pressure systems that did not move the entire uh, course or lifespan of the storm. They didn't move. And um, that was amazing. So it kept this storm on a very specific track, right? Now, by the way, this track just so happened to be uh, a track that the military-industrial complex hates. Did you guys know that? It's saturated. Some areas, again, that shouldn't have been saturated. Anything that goes into Tallahassee, um, near those Air Force bases is a no-go. And that's a severe no-go, right? Tallahassee was sunk right there on the coast. Houses were, it was up to the brim with the uh, surge. And that was extremely damaging to what they were, whatever they were working on, right? A lot of SOCOM operations take place underneath there. So uh, that was something else. It was something else. The other interesting things about this storm, it was quite vast, but there was a controlling high pressure sitting right above it, but I didn't see until today. So I found that to be quite extraordinary. And if you guys saw the breakdown of this storm, it, it in fact did exactly what we talked about. It was, uh, it was forced to the east, just like we talked about. Right, because most uh, dependable models have this thing going, you know, a little, a little west and up and west. Well, it didn't. It went on an eastern track, and it stayed on that track. It was squashed on a highway, and uh, that was quite interesting. The power was sucked out of this thing. <clears throat> Had it not been for those high pressures, uh, we would not be talking today. We wouldn't. Because most of these, most of those places would have been underwater. It would have actually dumped, probably, estimates are up to 50 inches of rain. It would have been a once in an existence storm. It would have, it would have kept growing because the temperatures to feed it were there. Right? And that's what the ISS was monitoring. Uh, a lot of people were quite worried about it. But those high pressure systems, they just sat there. They did not move the entire time. And they're still out there now. They're still out there now, as though they're controlling factors uh, for this storm. Now, there, there are things that go with it. I mean, even I lost power last night, this storm. <laughs> Flooding was uh, no joke. It was no joke. So it was lots of uh, rain. But I want to share with you guys something. Seems like a bad situation, right? When you have something like this happen, it was, it was an experience. Because I'll, 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 two things I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what I took from this storm. And what I took from this storm is going to be needed the next time. And you guys can be witnesses to everything I'm saying. Because it will be needed for the next storm. Which, by the way, is right around the corner. That it is. So, as I go through this and lay this out, it's going to be simple, and it is also a life law. A life law is something that, uh, whether you be a believer or not, it still happens the same way. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, it rains upon the just as well as the unjust. You guys familiar with that? In this case, this is a life law, right? This is the beginning 
of a trend, not the end. This was not a warning. This was more a preparatory uh, type uh, storm than anything else. Lots of indicators. Okay? And all too often we think these things are horrible. They're bad. But I ask you this. Why would it ever take place in the first place? Now I do understand that men like to play with weather. But I'll share this with you. There are limitations on what man can do with weather. They can seed clouds. Right? They can actually increase and decrease vortices. Which takes a... Um, quite a bit of manipulation and flights and dumping and everything else, right? They can do that. They can. They can. But explain this. Why is it that their key places in the USA and abroad are suffering big time? Think about that. If they can cause these storms, then why are key locations that they desperately need suffering the way they do? Strange, huh? Why would they destroy their own facilities at least 10 times in one year? Odd, isn't it? Right? So something, something hasn't gone right. So I'll share this with you. Sometimes we give man more credit than what they actually have. Man is capable of quite a few things. There are some things man is not capable of. And all too often, what man tries to do is overridden by forces they still don't yet understand. We should understand them. They do not. Right? They don't understand them. It was, uh, what was it, the year before last? A storm killed one of their own leaders. And that was, a, that was tragic. It was. For, the, for that community. There were other cases where training was messed up. Desperate training was needed. It was messed up. Caused some setbacks for years. That caused about a 15 20 years sent back. So things have happened that they weren't responsible for. When you're dealing with microwaves, like HARP, right? Suppose HARP was fully engaged. What do you think HARP would do? Anybody. What do you think it would do? Now, we're not talking theory, right? but what do you think it would do? Anybody? What do you think it would do? And I'm quite familiar with HARP. I, in fact, I'm intimately familiar with HARP. There are lots of harp stations all over the place. Many things have been written about harp. I remember sitting in a harp facility one time, and harp was blamed for something, but the system had been down for about a year and a half. Hmm. About a year and a half. Sometimes people get a little zealous. So it is to say, listen, in the absence of facts, they're going to blame someone for something, right? What better instrument to blame that on than harp? I can see where people do that. I can see that. But if harp were fully engaged, it would simply heat up the atmosphere. That's what it would do. It would just heat up the atmosphere. Can it cause adverse weather conditions? Yes, it can. But it causes more trends than anything else. They have spot weapons or their weather spot weapons. What a weather spot weapon can do, it, it, it contains a set of chemicals and minerals. Once those weapons are set loose and then harp engages with certain frequencies, right? there's an ability to cause specific cloud formations. That was also studied. Like what makes a cumulonimbus? What makes a stratus cloud? Things of that nature. right? But its most notable usage was to heat up the atmosphere so it could be seen from space to complement the aiming of something else. Does it make it a nefarious weapon of some sort? Well, back in those days, they were thinking about planetary protection. Do you guys remember MacArthur? Anybody? General MacArthur. Do you guys remember him? He was quite, uh, quite an extraordinary fellow. With, uh, he, he, was, he had quite the resolve himself. He was deeply concerned, deeply concerned about this UFO phenomena. He was deeply concerned about briefings he received, deeply concerned. And he would often tell, and, you know, especially young people who were coming up, that they were the ones that would have to set up the architecture to engage these 
others. That's where that term others came from, MacArthur. That term sticks to this day. That's what a lot of people who are read in, in, in to a degree, not fully in like the movies or anything, or, or some Tom Clancy novel, but those who are read into that uh, issue, they call them the others. Anyway, he was the one. He was the one who started to see the idea that we need some sort of defensive capability against such things. And guess what? We do have defensive capabilities against such things. We do have communication bursts that can actually travel light years. Man has gone a bit further than what most people think he has gone. They do things behind the scenes, under the covers, out of the realm of oversight, right? They do that. They do that quite a bit because they know what's coming. They, they are very familiar with an ancient story. And if you take note, most of those generals back then at that time, they knew the Bible. Do you know that? They knew what the Bible was. They knew what the book of Enoch was. They knew what the findings were in South America. They saw them. They were presented to them. Right? So they knew exactly what that was. And they prepared for it. Having said all that, yes, man has developed some extraordinary things, some very exotic things. But man has often failed at the simplest of things, like controlling weather. I mean, catastrophic failure. Right? Think of it. Why would we hemorrhage so much money to other countries if we could, in fact, simply control their weather? If I had the ability to control weather, I wouldn't have to give anybody any money. You wouldn't have to do that at all. Because you could control weather. Right? It lets you know that man cannot. Never forget the scriptures either. That it's your Father in heaven who would bring tempest upon the earth. He would be in the whirlwind. He purposes these storms. He would bring them upon people in the end times. See, if somebody believes that man can manipulate all this weather, they have to throw out the Bible. Yeah, that works. Controversy. I'm saying that because this system was unnatural, dangerous. It did damage. But how it did damage is what people should pay attention to. I'll go ahead and tell you there's another storm just like this for me right now. It'll be um, probably around us and take the same storm track next week. Next week, there's going to be a duplicate storm, likely of a little more intensity than this one has. And it will not dissipate like this one did. You guys know that. There's also a smaller one that will likely start to form, and they go right up the East Coast. And then there's one more. One more storm that will likely hop over Mexico into the Gulf and start doing damage to Texas and those Gulf states. So it's not the end of anything. It's the beginning of something, right? But if you guys were to take everything in stride as though your father is permitting something purposely, here's what you would find, especially with this storm. This storm exposed vulnerabilities. You guys ever have something to do and you say, okay, I got to do this and do this and let me go ahead and get prepped. Like your preparations, lots of people want to prepare for things just like this, correct? Don't you guys want to be prepared for storms like this? For incoming meteorites, incoming missiles, right? Don't you want to be prepared for international war, for terrorism, things of that nature, right? This storm revealed some things, 
First of all, when it came, everybody said, okay, we're prepared, this, that, and the world. This storm began to exploit those preparations. From the sheer duration and strength of this storm, it began to expose cracks and preparations. Now, those who are wise, instead of complaining, right, instead of being totally overwhelmed by it, they could have pointed out every single vulnerability in their own preparations, making sure it won't happen again. And it just so happens, whenever the Lord does this, any vulnerability there is, he's already told you about. But here's us. We prepare, yes, but not all the way. We don't put ourselves all the way in our preparations. We don't give it a thousand percent, do we? We prepare because we'll always run this scenario through our minds. What if it does not happen? All right? So we give it about 50%. And then something like this comes. And it begins to expose what you have not prepared for. And sure enough, everything that goes wrong goes wrong in those areas you've already been warned about, that you've been told about. The Lord will never have you prepare for something you cannot overcome. Do you know that? He'll never have you go through something that cannot be mitigated. Do you know that? If we would simply listen to him and not the expert infants called mankind all the time, we'd be much better. This was, in fact, a learning experience. Some of the people in Florida who have properties in certain areas, massive vulnerabilities, they probably should not put their properties back there again or may need to fortify them by way of steel. Some of these houses that sit on the beaches, instead of wooden supports with rebar or small iron tubing in them, they should use the full iron cage. They wouldn't have to worry about the storm, would they? In fact, something could come and wipe everything out. That house would still stand. They could fortify things and do it correctly. But here's the problem. It takes a storm like this to make it real. Would you guys agree? It takes a situation to make those preparations a necessity. Only after these things start wiping things out, people say, well, this is not going to catch me again. I'm going to get off my duffets and do it right this time. And normally when things are going wrong, what do you end up doing? You end up having to do something you already knew you had to do in the first place. Right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Hmm? Anybody know what I'm talking about? King David did that. A few times. Solomon did that a few times. He did. Jeremiah did that a few times. Same principles, same things, right? Haphazardly looking at things, and then all of a sudden, the real thing comes about we're not ready. What do you guys think would happen if those biblical events that we see come to pass? Let me remind you of this one thing. Here's the scripture. Nations in distress, with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. I'll say it again. Nations in distress, with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. What does that tell you? If the seas and the waves are roaring, wind speeds are up and storms are all over the place. So imagine a time when six of these storms are over the whole globe. And they're probably, you know, two and a half times bigger than what they are. Obviously carrying larger forces, right? A true hypercane, both in the summertime and the wintertime. Think about that. That would be water and ice and more water all over the place. And then think of a time when that went away. But a bitter drought came. The wind speeds increased even more. Dust began to blow all over the place. Men become desperate. Very desperate. They began to attack each other for the sake of small resources. 
All crops die. All preparations destroy. Think about that. We live in a time where these things could actually unfold. So how do you really get ready for this? How do you get ready for this? Taking the word of God seriously. In fact, giving the word of God your all. Trusting him with everything that you are. Think about that. Trusting him with everything that you are. Well, I certainly do hope people are preparing because this was an indicator. If this was only a flashcard, a reminder, an indication of what is to come, I really do think people should get ready. There are times in the Bible where it states, times will get so bad, men will drop their weapons and go back to their home countries. Can you imagine what would cause people in the middle of combat to drop their weapons and go home? Anybody? You, if In order for a person to do that, can you imagine the mindset of a person who drops their weapon and goes home? who refuses to fight, to engage anymore, and they go home. Well, first of all, you can only do that if you start thinking about everybody losing everybody. If something were so bad that you ever thought in your mind, everybody's about to lose everybody they love, you wouldn't care who gave you the order to fight anybody. You would say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to spend my last moments with those I love. I will not waste it serving these causes anymore. Think about that. When a soldier, by his own, you know, his own internal fortitude, says, I will not obey any more orders. I'm going back to the people I love. What news could ever cause a person to do that? I suspect not all, but some of you here will find out. Not everybody. Some of you here will find out. And all these things that are happening right now are indicators, signs, it's all. They help us prepare. This storm, this storm is going to help some states get their act together. This morning, there were a couple of states. They said, well, we're going to finally set up the drainage systems for the entire city so that if these rivers begin to crest, we have an alternative um, um, avenue where we can actually open up channels and take the, whole, the water down out of the whole city. Really? And, and, and the cost of this? Is less than, uh, I believe it was less than $400,000. And they do, you, you mean to tell me it took this storm and I believe uh, it, like five floods to finally get people to come together and say, we need to come together and build something that's for everybody that everybody can benefit from. Can you guys imagine a city that would actually set up relief valves, but if a river crested, they could open up those relief valves, having an alternative channel for that water to flow. And the city would not be drenched or or just, you know, totally consumed by water anymore. We're smart enough to do these things. The problem is individual greed. Who's going to call the shots? Who's going to run the show? That's the problem. If that can be surrendered, many things could be accomplished. They really could. So you're going to have a lot of people get together and do that. They know for a fact that, in, I believe it was in Hawaii, they tested those incineration machines where they can actually evaporate water at an accelerated rate. So think about, think about a machine that can actually take uh, tens, of, tens of millions of gallons of water and evaporate that water within you know, uh, a handful of seconds. Can you imagine that? It'd be a lot of steam, yes but it would not be in the form of that water and it would come back down to the earth. Ideas like that, right? 
They have found spots in the earth that they have evacuated substances from that can be pumped with hot steam and it will coalesce, condense, not take a lot of room and go right back down into the earth where it recirculates. Coal miners do it, don't they? We, we cause these, you know, they, we come up with these innovations on a smaller scale to save money. Don't you think it's time we come up with these innovations to save the quality of life? My goodness. If you knew that a storm would not ruin your day, you would be a happier person. You'd be a much more joyful person. Do you know what causes a lack of that joy is a threat against your life? I wonder how long it's going to take humanity to figure that one out. But don't worry, the father has to blame. He's bringing all of it to a close, he is. To a close. Maybe not in the way you think, but to a close. Somebody had an interesting question today. Something came up. I wanted to address that too. Somebody said, we're supposed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Have you guys heard of that? Now, I want you guys participate in this, right? Participate in this, please. So that we can all come to one conclusion, so that we can all see it. Can you do that? Anybody ever? Anybody? Because listen, here's what normally happens. When somebody says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that's a very sincere person. And sometimes when you have these Middle Eastern conflicts, it can cause an aggravation in those who say, wait a minute, the word says pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Why don't they have peace? Why don't they have peace? We're supposed to pray for it, the peace of Jerusalem. And they'll bring it out. And, and, and so then something happens that we really shouldn't do, but we do it kind of not really, we're not targeting anybody for it. Right? We'll say, well, everybody ought to join in and, and let's get this done. Right? Let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem, which, by the way, is a good idea. But there's a problem. Here's a problem. Big problem. The, the, one of the biggest ones is this. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing Jesus ever taught us to do was ever by force. In fact, if prayer is not given from the heart, it is null and void. That's what our Father teaches if a person prays and they cannot believe what they're praying for, they, they, he says that person ought not believe they're going to receive anything. These are the words of Christ. Right? right? So, let's go find it. See, we got to knock it out. Because what if you leave that thing? It, it's kind of like people right now. People right now, they'll say, people say this, people say. My, I hear it all the time. People say, Mike doesn't believe in the rapture. That's what they'll say. You don't believe in the rapture. Well, I believe in Jesus. I don't even know how to believe in a, a, an event. How do you believe in an event? To believe in something is to embrace it and follow it. Right? To advocate for that thing. You can't believe in something like that. I know it's a bit sarcastic, but I'm quite serious when I say that. Now, do I believe that, that the Lord is going to execute his word, what he says, at the last trump? Those who are alive, they're going to be called up to meet him in the air? Absolutely. I believe in the words of the Father, period. If God said it, it's going to be just that way. The problem is, I'm never going to argue with anybody over that subject. I'm not going to turn that subject into a fight. And a lot of people, they turn those subjects into fights. I'll never join in with that. But if God said it, if Jesus decreed it and ordained it, then it is. It's as simple as that. Hmm? See that? Somebody says, so no rapture, but the Bible says it's true. Well, that word rapture, I, again, I don't go with the popular things of the world. That was a motivational term people began to use, and they get them excited about leaving, right? Here's my problem with that. 
already know the Lord's going to do exactly what he said he would do. I don't have to be reassured that Jesus is Jesus, that the Father is the Father. I don't have to be reassured that he's going to get all of his children according to his word. I don't have to be reassured that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. I know. But when I looked at the history of that, and I saw the men behind it, and how they pushed it, and how they were wrong about the date and had people sell everything, and how they ruined people's lives, I said, nope, I'm not following that same thing. I'm not going to do it. And then, you know, just like human beings, we begin to justify subject matter that we stick up for. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Hmm? Nothing wrong with that, right? It's the offense people begin to hear. And I'm, it, like right now, I guarantee you people heard the offense and not what I'm saying. Did anybody hear what I just said? Anybody? Did anybody hear what I said? Let, let me, did I say I did not believe that Jesus would come and get his own as he said he would? Huh? I'm trying to tell you, I do not believe in what man makes up, lifts up above the living God. When you lift up a subject above Jesus Christ, that is wrong. Nothing goes above Christ. So how in the world can people argue over a topic? Because somebody has lifted something up above Jesus of Nazareth. I believe the last trump Jesus will do exactly what the Father instructs him to do. And those who are alive are going to be caught up together to meet him in the air. Do you believe that? But just because I did not say harpazo or rapture, people say, well, he didn't believe in the rapture. They're not hearing. All they hear is a fence, like a team. And they'll say, well, if you're not wearing yellow, you don't believe in Jesus like me. Crucify him. Get him out of here. I'm not one of those people. That's exactly how racism got started, isn't it? Isn't it? See, I believe in the words of Jesus of Nazareth, not the words of men. I believe in the words that Jesus said. Men can add to it all they want, but I believe in the words that Jesus spoke. I'll advocate those subjects he advocated. I'll follow behind his word till the day of death. I will. Why? I don't need to escape because he is my Messiah. If Jesus is my Savior and King, I don't need to escape anything. He determines if I live or die. Nobody else does, right? It's, the, it's that topic, it's the elevation of the topic above Jesus of Nazareth. I'll never, ever do that with any subject, nor with any person. Now, that gets me into a lot of trouble because I will never allow anybody to sit above Jesus of Nazareth in my life. That's why I don't argue. But if people could hear, they would have heard the whole thing. That I believe in the words of Christ. But I will not come behind a topic and advocate it when it is full of offenses and fighting. See, I know this is real, that God is not behind anything that causes such things. Our Father is holy, and if he gives us something, it's going to produce something holy. I know that Satan is the author of confusion, and when people allow the spirit of offense to come into any topic, they're not hearing correctly. They allow offense to interpret what they're hearing. And they get mad for no reason. How can a topic, a promise, that Jesus is coming back to get those who are alive at a very detrimental time, how could anybody ever get angry at that? I've heard some people say, well, there is no time when Christ is going to come back and get everybody. Well, that's a lie, because he is. He specifically said at the last Trump, didn't he? He specifically said those who are alive at that time are going to be called up together with him in the clouds. So anybody who says that time is not coming is a liar and the truth is not in them. They're denying the words of Christ. 
Hmm? My point is this, so you understand it. You know what that, here's what that means. That means I believe in what Jesus said. That the dead in Christ will rise first. And those who are alive, they're going to be caught up together with him in the clouds. Just because I don't say rapture does not mean I don't believe in what you're utilizing that word for. Can't you see my issue? I don't do the elevation of man's stuff over the Lord's things. Can't you see it? I've never done that. I'm not going to take man's concepts and his ingenious ideas and put them side by side with the words of my Messiah. No, I will not. Won't do it. Hmm? Hmm? Somebody said, you mock your brothers and sisters. Another one, you're not hearing anything. You're not hearing correctly. You're hearing with offense. That's the same age-old argument that's been used from day one. You didn't hear anything I said. You're hearing for the offense. You're not hearing for the alignment of Scripture. And I can't apologize for that. I believe in Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus of Nazareth. I simply have just a simple thing I will never do. You guys have never heard me talk about authors of books, have you? Have you? Do I sit up and talk about authors of books? No. Do I sit up and talk about men and elevate them, that you should go and listen to men and this, that, and no, I don't do that. I don't do that. You never heard that. And you won't hear that. What you will hear is that I encourage people to listen to Christ Jesus. Does it mean the concept of what they're calling the rapture is wrong? I just told you what the truth was. If a person says that what people are calling the rapture, that concept is wrong, then they're lying. Because Jesus said at the last trump that he would Come and get those who are alive. He said that. So anybody who says that's not true, they're lying. But I will not elevate mankind's ideologies above the word of the Lord. It's as simple as that. They can call it whatever they want to call it. I will say what Jesus said. It's that simple. That's just me. And if you're looking for anything else, it'll never come out. It doesn't come out that way. It does not come out that way. My advice is try not to hear, try not to listen by the spirit of offense. Because sometimes you can be so ready to defend a subject that you will hear something specific and jump at the person who said it, not hearing the whole thing in context. That's not wise for any of us. Hmm? Not wise. There is another one. Who who said you you elevated that false prophet? What false prophet did I elevate? I'll let the people let you know. Anybody bring that to mind? What what who did I elevate that's not real? No one. Brandon Biggs, what? Have you, uh, since we're all human, have you, uh, you okay? You all right? Hopefully you're okay. I hope you're okay. Where'd you come up with that one at, the other day? Uh, no, you didn't hear what I said either, did you? You know what I said about that gentleman? The gentleman who had the Daniels chart? Each person has to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Each person. If that person, if that's the same person you're talking about, is that the same person? Because if not, I don't know uh, who you're talking about. Wrong guy? Well, I don't know who you're talking about then. I don't know who Brandon Briggs is. Who in the world is Brandon Briggs? I think you got that confused. 
for one, I do not elevate individuals. I don't do that. I elevate Christ. That's been, what, for about 38 years, almost 40 years. Just Christ. That's all. Hmm? Somebody said, I never knew who Brandon Briggs was. That won't stand anyway because I don't read things of other folks like that. Sorry. You must have heard something very wrong. Yeah. Never heard of that guy. Never heard of him. But nice try. That, that's a serious thing. See, in the Bible it says you have to be careful how you hear. And I'll say it again. I'll say it again. If you hear with the spirit of offense, you're not going to hear what the person is saying. You're going to hear a person speak against whatever concept you're holding to yourself. Hmm? Hmm. Somebody said, Brandon is a man who had a vision of Trump getting shot in the air. I still don't know who that is. I'm, I've, I, I'm hearing you guys speak about him. I think I heard Pastor Paul one time speak about him. But other than that, I never heard of the guy because I don't search the internet like that. And the reason why I don't go into other people's writings and things of that nature, right? Not like that. Is because I would not be genuine with what the Lord has given me. If if I were to go into other people's uh, books and things like that, right? It would likely cause me to dilute what the Lord has put in me. So I can't do that. I have no idea who that guy, never heard of that guy. Never heard of him. Never. I know people get angry because I never, I don't hear people like that, right? I know. You guys know folks I don't know, right? I did sit down and listen to the folks in uh, the webinars that uh, one of the webinars Pastor Paul had. Yeah. But that was it. Somebody said, do you mention him? It must have, you can go back and listen to the, audio and i'll tell you this i still don't advocate for people and i did not advocate for him either right um if i heard him on pastor paul and somebody has a prophecy and they tell the truth i'll listen if they tell you a prophecy i will tell you guys the exact same thing every single time your father does two things and i'm saying this with all love if a person has a prophecy about anything and that thing come perfectly true, it still does not mean that person is holy. God said that he would give that to a person, that thing would come true, and then that person later on would start saying, let us go and follow other gods. The Father already wrote, he had given to us, that if a person does this, God does this and allows this person to bring that forward and to be exact like that, and then to go and tell you to go and follow other gods, to see if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. When I have dreams, or if I say something that comes exactly true, it does not mean I'm holy. That does not mean I'm holy. That's why I love the Word of God. Because being correct does not make you a prophet. Being correct does not make you holy. Being exact does not make you holy. Again, the Lord said that if a prophet come and tell you something and that thing come to pass, but then that prophet starts to say, let us go and follow other gods. It's written that the Lord your God doth this to see if you love him with all your heart and all your soul. Do you know that? That's an actual scripture. So the Lord will actually put the truth in a vessel. And that vessel will start to get you to go and follow something else. And the God will do this to see if you love him with all of what you are. And I love that concept. That means if a person has a dream, well, then they have a dream. If it comes true, well, then th it comes true, right? But it does not mean that vessel is a holy vessel is what I'm telling you. That's what I'm telling you, right? I think people, that's a, that's a deep, that's a, sometimes people will say, or they think a false prophet or a true prophet is somebody who says something correct. That's incorrect. Prophecy is to say what the Lord said. It has nothing to do with prediction. 
It has everything to do with saying the decreed word of the living God, which is why Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Hmm? That's how that works. See how that works? That's how that works. Yes, back to the original conversation. You guys do see them. You guys do see them. Just so you guys know. Just so you know. All those things are written for what to qualify us, to help us keep qualified. To help us stay the course. Because what happens when you start hearing the wrong voice? You'll follow it. And what's the result of following the wrong voice? Your own personal destruction. It pulls you away from the living God. And when you're pulled away from the living God, no one should no one should ever have to endure that. Never forget this is a walk of love. It's not forced. It is each of us having a hope that the other person can have a relationship with Christ, can be restored what the Lord wants them to be. It has nothing to do with force. It has nothing to do with one knowing more than the other. It has everything to do with a person making it all the way home. Remember that. There are so many things that will often try to make it about something else. But it's not. Okay. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Somebody find that in the Psalms. Can you find that in the Psalms? It's in the Psalms. And there's another scripture. Because this this also, this, this gets entangled with people. And, and you hear, it's almost like a conflict. There are two groups behind this. Some people say, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Right? And then some people say, well, no, that's not what the word, the word doesn't exactly say that. You know, well, it says that, but, but they'll have the but on there, which causes this center line of confusion. So how do you end that confusion? You consult the word again in context, and you see the truth of it. That's how. And if you do that collectively, listen, when you do that collectively, you're doing it in front of witnesses. And when you do that collectively in front of witnesses, everybody starts to see it the same way. But then when you see the other portions maybe you didn't see before, then it all comes together. Once you see the truth of it, it's instantly solved. There's no more dilemma, right? No more dilemma. That's part of the beauty of a council. Because once you have witnesses to actual knowledge and people are sharing of that same knowledge, you get rid of divisions and confusion and all this other stuff that waits. It just waits. And it waits, believe it or not, it waits in all of us because if you're passionate about something, you're going to defend that something. And if you become defensive concerning that thing you hold to your heart, listen, if you become defensive concerning that thing you hold to your heart, you're going to hear bits and pieces in a very skewed way, oftentimes, and then arguments ensue, right? Do you guys say that? That's about right. You hear half of a person's sentence, and you're defensive about a specific subject. There you are. Now, people are finding some good, fine. Let's get these scriptures in there. Let's get these scriptures. Where did it begin? Somebody brought up a good point. Listen, listen. Jeremiah 7.16. Well, let's go look at that. In Jeremiah 7.16. Let's go find it. Now, while they're doing this, I want someone to look up what Jesus said about Jerusalem. Specifically, one thing, because we'll have to do it, this in three parts. Jesus gave a declaration to Jerusalem. When they were weeping for him, he said, no, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Jesus made a standing declaration. He continued to do it. So let me, let me get the Jeremiah thing first. Are you kidding? This thing does not want to. 
Yes, I do. Okay, Jeremiah. What was that? Or comes it? Jeremiah seven sixteen. Jeremiah seven sixteen states, "By self states, therefore pray not." Listen, therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Now you did say Jeremiah seven sixteen. I'm sorry, seven. He said Jeremiah seven sixteen. As for you, do not pray for this people, and do not lift up a cry and pray. Okay, Jeremiah eleven fourteen. Therefore, do not pray for this people, nor lift up. Okay, we got there. Jeremiah fourteen eleven through twelve. So the Lord said unto me, Do not pray for the welfare of this people. When they fast, I am not going to listen and cry for the burnt offering and the grain offering. I am not going to accept them. Rather, I am going to make an end of them by the sword, famine, and pestilence. That was the declaration in the book of Jeremiah. That's exactly what the Lord said He would do. In the context of things, because Israel disobeyed him. They fornicated with the sacred wisdom he bestowed upon them. They fornicated with everybody else. So then when it came time for them, for retribution to come upon them, God said he basically would not hear them. Ezekiel spoke something similar. When God spoke through Ezekiel and told Ezekiel, that their priests were corrupted, that they were leading people astray and weakening his people by falsehoods, but that the people began to love it like that. But then we get to Psalms, right? In the book of Psalms, there was a specific prayer for Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee, right? This is what King David is saying, Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, Peace be with thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy God. Now that was David's prayer. And if you look at David's quest during that time, what was David doing? Anybody know? What was David doing? Let me give you the context, because you'll read it anyway. It's like you're going to a house, and you say, thank God for this house. And you make a declaration upon that house, because you dedicate that house unto the Lord. Now, follow me in this. You dedicate that house unto the Lord, and everything in it unto the Lord. So the Holy Spirit takes over. And you say, anybody who blesses this house will be blessed. Why? Because it's declared unto the Lord. You say anybody who curses this house is going to be cursed. Why? Because it's, it's dedicated unto the Lord. But then a year, two years passes by, and people begin to practice sin in that house. All of a sudden, a big screen TV comes in there, and the wrong things are watched on the television. That's the desecration of what's been, what? Dedicated to the living God. And then when correction comes, you say, well, there's nothing wrong with this. Everybody does it. So now you're no longer accepting correction by, of your desecration of that thing you committed unto the living God. Follow me on this. But then you stick up because you like the entertainment. You like what you're doing. You do it so much, you say, I don't see any problem with it. See, at first you wouldn't have anything in the house because you declared it unto the Lord. The same thing David did. It was declared unto the Lord for his usage, for his glory, right? But then, but then others stepped in. They began to fornicate on all sides with all their little neighbors. They took away God's things and gave them to others, and they implemented the practices of paganism and some other things in the temple of the Most High, desecration. And they got to the point where they didn't want any prophet to come and tell them anything that would correct them from their doings. But they specifically said, no, don't tell us what God said. Tell us good things, how that we're going to continue to prosper doing what we like to do. They essentially told people they were not going to change. They were going to keep doing the way they're doing. And then they would often say, well, everybody else is doing what they're doing. 
I don't see them facing any penalty. Why should we? They became highly rebellious. And then God's declaration came. Because you have desecrated and have chosen to desecrate what was clean and given to you. Hmm? The Lord said, I'm not going to accept. I mean, it gets bad. It gets to the point where he said, I won't accept your offerings. Uh, you, you, you're having your feast days in vain. Your oblation is in vain. That's, that's what God said. And in the book of Jeremiah, God decreed a time of indignation that would be upon Jerusalem. For, but why? Because they just totally desecrated his house, his things, and his promise. They turned away from it. They would not hear the instruction of the living God. And in the Bible, it says they killed the prophets. They did. They consorted with people who couldn't stand the prophets. And there's a time of indignation that's coming. Hmm? When something is dedicated, as it was with King David, there's a blessing in blessing those things that are dedicated unto the Lord. But what happens when that thing that was dedicated unto the Lord is defiled and then is willingfully defiled? What happens? In order for it to be clean again, God must purge it. The people wouldn't do it, so God's going to do it. You go through the Bible and then you find Daniel saying something. The angel Gabriel told Daniel concerning Jerusalem, wars and desecrations are determined, and desolations are determined until the end. Where does that leave us now? What did Jesus say, by the way? Jesus is the one that loses the four horsemen, that loses the events upon his own house. In fact, he told them to flee when they see the abomination of desolation set up where it ought not be. And we know that's in Jerusalem. So a dark, beastly figure is going to be given power to overcome Jerusalem. And he'll make it desolate. He'll set up the abomination of desolation. And Jesus said during that time, flee. But see, there's something happening before that time, during that time, and after. Here it is. Most people don't like, how many of you ladies like rats? Do you like rats? Ladies, do you like rats? How many ladies here like rats? Anybody here like rats? Hmm? Anybody like rats? Most females do not like rats. However, a rat is nothing more than a hairless squirrel. Do you know that? It's just, a, you'll see how cute a squirrel is, how nasty a rat is. Yet, when you see a rat, it's just repulsive to some people. And you can ask that person, why is that rat so repulsive? They say, I don't know, I just don't like them. There it is. I don't know, I just don't like them. That's the real answer. Well, guess what? God put a trait in the spirit of mankind. Now, if a person is truly devoted to the Most High and they truly embrace the words of Jesus, a certain repulsion is destroyed. All the tyrants of the earth had a repulsion they couldn't explain. Hitler was a good example of this. He hated the Jews. Those who were loyal to Hitler before he was Hitler hated the Jews. I mean, they hated the Jews. And come to find out, most people who have this authentic hatred of the Jews, they want nothing to do with Christ. It's a repulsion they have. Have you noticed through history the problem people have had with the Jews? Who they were? The ones that had this repulsion, just like a person would hate a rat, so they hated the Jews. They couldn't explain it. 
Even when the Lord said, light hath no fellowship with darkness. Even I know this in my own life. If you're one of those people, and believe it or not, despite my job, I'm a person who would never hurt another person. Not doing that. Do you not know that there are people who have hated me? And they didn't know why. In my life, people have either liked me, right? They were drawn to me out of a curiosity of something. They heard my voice and they ended up evaluating it and said, okay, he's okay. Or they absolutely 100% hated me. They didn't even know me, but they hated me. And a full rejection. And I know why they hated me. When you know what's in you, right? You already know who's going to like and who won't. It's not very surprising. Just like I know that most people who are drawn to my voice have been abused in their youth. I know that. It's a specific type drawing. Also know that people that get angry with me are those who were abandoned by parents when they were younger. And all too often, I can't respond the way that they desire me to respond and they feel that abandonment again. They get upset and angry. I totally get that too. I understand that. That's why I give people much space. But the same way I understand that, there's also an understanding of how God made Israel, how God made the Jews, the spirit that's in them that they carry, why some are so willing to accuse them, even to the point of crucifixion, and how some are so willing to defend them, even when not knowing them. Hmm? And the Bible, it says, it originated and said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem until Jerusalem backslid. They backslid. They walked away from what the Lord had for them. The Lord t- says to this very day, until he returns, they're not totally back yet. How do we know that? Because Jesus said, he'll not drink the new wine with him again. He'll not, they'll not see him again until they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, when they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Jesus will return again. But until they say that, they'll not see him again. They will not see him again. Not you, they will not see him again. And it just so happens in Revelation when you see these people in Jerusalem who are stuck there going through this siege. Not everybody is going through that. They are going through that. Not you. You're the Gentiles grafted into the branch. The Lord has already said that he would accept your sacrifices above theirs. You had you shared no heritage with him, yet you willfully entered into the practices that they refused. You can find that in Malachi. You can find that in the books of the Bible where God describes the Gentiles, how he would accept their offerings before he would accept those of his own. Books like Isaiah 5, chapters like Isaiah 5, where the Lord will purge his vineyard. It is needed, necessary. But before anybody out there starts cursing him, says, see, you don't pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Or before somebody says, see, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. When you understand the context and the history of the Bible and the whole story, because the whole Bible is context, you clearly see what happened. When you know the whole story, it makes sense. See, because you've got to be careful not to take directives from the Old Testament and enforce them today. Like if I were to tell you to go take your children out and stone them to death because they are sassy at the mouth, you know, with you, that's, you can't do that. It's written in the Bible, but you don't do that. Sometimes I'll give a talk on the blessings and curses. 
that were given at the beginning and people find out they're not on the blessing side. You know when it says your enemy is going to come at you one way and flee from you several ways? Listen, that's only if you keep the statutes, commandments, and judgments of the living God. In fact, the blessings in the Old Testament will only take place if you keep the statutes, commandments, and judgments of the living God. When I found that out, I was crushed because I read all the curses. I identified them. I said, I can't keep the statutes, commandments, and judgments of the living God. I can't keep all that. And then I flipped right to the New Testament, and it made me love the Lord even more. You know why? Have I kept the commandments? Have we all kept the commandments? No, we have not. And to break one is to break them all. So legally, we're supposed to be under a curse. But through Christ, we're not. Hmm? Legally, we're supposed to be condemned. But through Christ, we're not. Legally, we're supposed to be simply Gentiles. But through Christ, we're not. We're family. Something has happened during those times of declaration and the times of grace. And that something that happened was a sacrifice. And that sacrifice had a name. And his name is Jesus. We had already messed up. I had already messed up. I can't go back and keep the Ten Commandments after I've broken them. You can't do that. But Jesus became the sacrifice. And as the sacrifice... He also became king and lord. And as king and lord, he left us instruction, gave us the how-tos, told us the whys. He asked us to embrace them, simply embrace them. See, nothing is done by force through Christ. Nothing. Everything is done and established by love. Everything is willingfulness or not. Nothing can be forced. Only evil works by force these days. If a person desires to bless Jerusalem or pray for the peace of Jerusalem, then so be it. But let it be done in truth. A lot of people are trying to obey the scripture. The problem is the Bible contains the words of men and the words of the living God. I can hear men or what they're saying. I'll obey the Lord as he spoke through men. But I can see why David said what he said. Just as you would say, blessed are those who bless this brand new apartment the Lord has blessed me with. And cursed are those who curse this brand new apartment the Lord has blessed me with. When you have adoration for something, when you thank God for something, and it's an unequivocal blessing, the Holy Spirit will begin to speak through you. You will begin to declare things. Sometimes those declarations are out of your control. Not only is that found in the Psalms, but it's found in other books. In Jeremiah's conditional. And then in Jeremiah, it's totally broken down. And then in, when you continue to go on through the books of the Bible, you begin to see a story. Hmm? you begin to see a story. So, is there anything wrong with saying pray for the peace of Jerusalem? No. But let me ask you this. If somebody doesn't pray for the peace of Jerusalem in your timing, are you to turn around and curse that person? Never. Never. Is prayer ever to be forced? No. God doesn't want your forced prayers. He wants your genuine prayers. Your father knows what you have need of before you ask it. He already knows what the truth of your heart is. He knows when you're praying to him, with, if you have anything in you that is hateful against somebody else, he's not hearing your prayers in the first place. If you fail to forgive the slightest person, your father in heaven has not forgiven you. And you are condemned in that hour. 
Lord knows us through and through. Prayer should be your heart petitioning the Most High in truth. That's why Jesus said we must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's why the Lord gave us the Lord's Prayer. But people like control. Remember that. And they will utilize that control. And they will utilize scripture to exercise that control and teach it. Until we get to the point of time in the Bible when the word is not found. Isn't that what the word says? A time will come when the word is not found. In fact, a time has already come, the word said, that the Bible says, when men will no longer endure sound doctrine, but will heed to themselves teachers having itchy ears. I see it every day. More and more people are backing away from Jesus of Nazareth, almost rejecting the sacrifice, and they're trying to live their lives by some sort of forced, forced, fitting, of what the Lord has decreed. And the Bible says it would forbid people to marry. It would actually go back to that force system. That's why I don't like anger at all. Anger is a darkness, a pit. It is a part of hell itself. Because when things are done in anger, they're certainly not done in the Holy Spirit, nor in a spirit of holiness but they're done with a viciousness like a brood of vipers. And whatever words are spoken in that hatred become dangerous, foreboding, often dominating those who would bow to it. That's how cults get started. Cults always rule like that, don't they, by force. That's why if you leave a cult, they will excommunicate you. Got news for you. When you're dealing with God's people, and if you decide to turn your back and leave God's people, they're going to pray for you from the heart. It's not phony baloney. It's real. That means the day you come back, you're going to be welcomed with open arms. Do you know why? Because they will never stop loving you. That's why. That's called truth. That's called being real. That phony baloney stuff is like like breaking up a marriage because somebody won't wear a certain type shoe. Well, the establishment of that marriage was false in the first place. You mean to tell me the commitment can outlast a shoe? Isn't that what happens in this day and age? Yes, it does. Everything is conditional. People are conditioned. I'll tell you something. The Lord requested of all of us. The Lord Jesus requested of all of us. Can never be that way. In fact, have no conditions. Love always. That's why he said, love your enemy. That's why he said, do good to those who despitefully use you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you for his name's sake. Isn't it? That's right. Becoming these vices all too often found in the world. Once you do that, That's when you start to taste the liberty of Christ. That's when you know you have the freedom of the Messiah in your life. And whom the Lord has set free is free indeed. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. There's no bondage with the Spirit of the Lord. There's no vice, no anger, no malice with the Spirit of the Lord. There's no guilt, none of that stuff with the Spirit of the Lord. There is liberty with the Spirit of the Lord. And liberty, ladies and gentlemen, is something found in freedom itself. Liberty is never forced. No, liberty is always free. So a cup is offered to you to partake of it, but that's totally up to you. heard someone say when I was young, we have to rightly define the word of truth. What a wise saying. What a wise saying. Anyway, let me take a break. I'll be back in a few minutes, guys. Do, Do you guys see that about the peace of Jerusalem? 
A good example of Oregon 7, by the way, in Jeremiah. Jesus went further. He went a lot further. So you have these two. You, you can't turn away from these two halves, can you? You can't do it. But you put them all together. If, if you can see that full story, then you see it. And what is the what is the root of this? Here it is. You ready? Ready before I take a break? What's the root? Here it is. Do you know how many times I've heard people, I've seen people get upset when nobody prays with them? I mean, let me tell you all of you something right now. Do you guys think I would ever get angry or upset if you guys did not pray for me? Huh? I love you to pieces. But let me share this with you. I know for a fact Jesus prays for me. And if it came to his prayers and your prayers, I would take his every single time. Just so you know that. I'm saying that to tell you this. When, when, when you have a request, right? You don't drag people. You don't have to drag anybody into a prayer. No, no don't do it that way. If you initiate a prayer, then initiate a prayer. And I'll tell you something. Those who are like-minded will join you anyway. But never forget the most powerful king of kings and lord of lords is praying for you too. Never forget that. He prays for you. There is no more powerful prayer. Uh, there is no more problem. It's done. It's finished. Nobody's going to top that. So we can face the truth. Here it is. Sometimes we get nervous, irritated, scared. And in that mind frame, that's when we start saying, pray with me. And when somebody acts like they don't want to, they don't want to pray at that moment, we start pointing them out. Just pray with me, pray. And, it, and it, you start drawing people in. That's called a moment of weakness. So if you can remember that the Messiah prays for you, you'll be empowered. In truth, not falsehoods, but in truth. If you can remember that, you'll be empowered in truth. And you'll know that weakness, that's the illusion. It is, in fact, an illusion. Hmm? I'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT. Okay. Everybody back? Good. All right, so what so do you guys have that? Do you guys have that? Do you guys see how that works? From beginning to end of the word of God. I will tell you this though. When you read the entire word, it is a beautiful promise. It really is. Right? Now what will be the point of talking about the Rapture or Pazzo, um, praying for Jerusalem. We have a work to do. That's what. There are going to be people who come in this chat. They're going to be highly, they're going to be brand new, highly offended if somebody ever says the rapture is not real. Right? They will. You'll be highly offended. There are going to be some that come in here, and if you say the rapture is real, they're going to be offended, and you have to know the biblical foundation for both. So hopefully you guys got the bottom line. Hmm? Because let me ask you guys something. Is the rapture real? Yes or no? Now, if you've been listening, you'll get it right. Is it real? Yes or no? Anybody? Is the rapture real? Yes or no? Here's the answer. You can't just tell me yes. You have to tell me why and where. See the difference? 
Christ. That's what we're doing here. You just can't say the rapture's real. Why? Because you have people on both sides of the fence who need to know the truth of it. Right? We're studied. We're learned. We could say yes. And if somebody came in here and said, well, the rapture's not real, and you say, well, yes, it is. They'll say, well, the rapture's not you. So you say, no, it isn't. They'll say, well, the rapture's not real. Then you say, yeah, it is. It's just not called the rapture. And then you have to go into the definition of the rapture, the heart puzzle, right? Will the rapture apply to everybody? No, it will not. See, when you know the scriptures behind it, when you put context with it, you get rid of the argument. You get rid of the offense. And that's the point. You will have people who come in here who will be highly offended at either point. You're going to have people that come in here that will say, uh, we don't pray for the peace of Jerusalem because God has already determined and decreed upon them a destruction, which is real. So how do you answer somebody like that? How can you go back and say, no, you've got to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? How can you go back and say that when clearly somebody can read the declarations upon Jerusalem of its destruction? Then God will do that and carry it out. Again, Again, you have to know what the basis of that is in Scripture. Time for us to know the whole story. Not a piece of it. The whole story. Right? The whole story. People ask me all the time, do you believe in the rapture? And I say, no. They say, so you don't think God is coming back to get everybody just like he said Jesus? Well, I said, yes, I know he's going to do that. But you just say you don't believe in the rest. I said, no. And I have to explain myself. Right? I don't believe in things. I believe in Christ. What I believe, I follow. I don't follow the rapture. I don't follow that event. That's an event that the Lord will carry out in his own timing. And he will not fail. Hmm? I trust him that much. So something I never have to really entertain. My encouragement comes from this day. From the people in this day. Realize how delicate this day is. But also realize how easily offended we are. If more people come in this place, we can no longer entertain the spirit of offense in any degree. Hmm? So we have to be settled. See how that truth is? So no matter what you call it, that event will take place. Do you see the point? you see the point? To believe in something, right? There are three different definitions. Mine, because in my position, I keep sturdy with the scriptures. I never want to get into an area where I've mixed scripture with something else. The Bible is holy. The word is holy. It should be kept that way. If men have ideas, fine. But the word is holy. Hmm? The word is holy. You can believe that something is real. But to believe in something is to follow it. Do you hear me? You can believe that something is real, but to believe in something is to follow it. Now, why would that be important? Because I'm telling you right now, these people that are around here, they stipulate small little nuances just like that. So I can't haphazardly approach that subject. You'll appease one, make the other one angry. But if you do it the Lord's way, the Lord says he will give you words that no one will be able to gainsay against. That only happens when we stick to Scripture. So when somebody says, is the rapture real? You say, of course it's real, but it's not called the rapture. Then people start understanding. You say it any other way, it creates an argument. If you stick to Scripture, it's in context. 
because it does not apply to everybody. It does not. Only those who are alive at that time will experience that. And if you've ever read Revelation 7, when the mystery of God should be finished, the last trump, well, I can tell you right now, I may not make it to that time. Just like trillions of people before me didn't make it to that time. They thought they wouldn't, but they did not. But there will be a group that will make it to that time. They will. When all of us see that, then if somebody comes in and says something, then somebody else can take up where the other left off. Now, now we're a body. No longer divided. Now offense can no longer dictate how we respond, but we see the whole thing. Now nobody's upset, but everybody has an understanding that you can talk about the exact same subject in many different ways. But those who are Christians are expected to speak based upon Scripture. The representatives of Christ. You can believe in Christ. You can believe that the harpazo is real. You can believe that the rapture is real. But believe in Christ. See that difference? That's why I tell people I do not believe in the rapture. I believe that the rapture is real. To believe in something is to follow something. You can believe that something is real. It's very different than believing in something. You can believe in a person. Because you believe in their cause. Mm-hmm. Now you're starting to see. You guys starting to see. That'll save you lots of trouble. I've been there before. I've been there in front of 14,000 people talking about the same subject. Scriptures all over the place. And they can only hear at the very end. But guess what happened after three days? No one ever argued over that subject again. That, that was the miracle. That no one, they, they wouldn't argue over the subject again. They saw the truth of it. They could finally hear. And they said, ah, oh, that's how that works. That's how it works. That means Satan cannot creep in anything anymore. And when he cannot creep in, Right? Because people often want to know, how does the Holy Ghost come into a place? Some of you, some of you who were here remember what happened in COT. But listen, here's the main thing I want you to remember. It was not orchestrated. It was done through freedom. Nobody asked a soul to join in anything, and everybody joined in. Nobody asked anybody to pray, and everybody started praying. Nobody asked anybody to start quoting scripture and doing things that they did, but it came out anyway. It was absolutely done in the freedom from one spirit to the living God back to the people again, and the Holy Spirit was totally invited. It was not orchestrated, not by us. That's an atmosphere of holiness where nothing is forced and people voluntarily desire to give something of themselves to lift up the name of the Lord. And that will always happen because that happens all the time. You know what the problem is? There's always that one or two. There's always the off topic or the off thing or the off something that will introduce an element of force. And if we can rid ourselves of that element of force. Because you cannot force someone to go to heaven. You cannot force someone to accept Christ. You cannot force someone to petition to the living God. You cannot force another to obey. Can't do it. Because even if you force someone to obey, God will not accept it. He's quite clear about that. If it does not originate from the individual, it's not acceptable. 
Nothing he does is by force. Everything is by voluntary observance. Everything is done through worship. And that's what voluntary observance is. Worship. It's when you make up your mind to lift up the Most High. And when nothing is orchestrated, the Holy Spirit will take over. Healings will begin. Brokenness will be mended. Many things will take place. That's the real spirit, not this orchestrated thing. It's not the man-made stuff that people come around with and they're in the spirit and in 20 minutes after it's over, they're cursing at their family again. No, 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 none of that. And we're talking about everlasting healings that never go backward. People's sons were coming home. Some, some woman had, she was crying for her child. She said, I don't know where, they're, they're drug addicted, something like that. Please pray for them. And she requested that in that atmosphere. That the very night, the person came home. The child came home out the blue. You know that was the living God. Nobody orchestrated that. Nobody. That's what happens in the presence of the Holy Ghost. God will honor things from the children in those areas just like that. And that's real. You know what happens when you experience something real like that? You'll never accept the phony baloney again. You'll never accept it. You can tell the difference between the two. Um, you'll never accept anything phony. You'll say, nope, I'm not doing anything phony because I can have the real thing. That's what you'll desire, the real thing. Once you desire that, Satan is lost. He is lost. You guys know why Jesus came in the first place, right? Why did Jesus come? To destroy the works of the devil. How did Jesus say he would work in the earth? Does anybody remember? How did Jesus say he would work on this earth? He said it many ways, but I'll sum it up in this. He said, in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. Through you. Through you. How is that ever completed? By you being absolutely in Christ. Nobody else but in Christ. He said, if you are in me, I am in you. Right? He also said, if you keep my commandments, the Father and I will make our abode with you and will sup with you. My goodness. How awesome is that? For God to make his true home within you. Think you would know that? You better believe you'd know it. Those are the days when you don't take credit for anything anymore. That's when you know you've been looked after. That's when you stop guessing. And you know the Lord is Lord. And you know he's not going to fail. That's the day you never second-guessed Jesus Christ again. You'll never say, well, I'm not sure if he'll do this or that. You'll never say that again. Never. That's when you know. So get ready, because as these issues in the world continue to build up, people are going to get burned out. They're going to get burned out on one side of things, and they're going to be looking for sincerity and the real deal. God called to you to be representatives of his truth. That includes the reality of spiritual things. All of us are called to a much higher standard. All of us have. The Lord's work can be done if we agree to be vessels in which that work can be done. All of us have points of stubbornness. Let's go ahead and face it. We do. 
But that's where we assist each other to get over those points of stubbornness, right? Because a breakout will soon take place. I can't stress that enough. They will not be comfortable to see. Nevertheless, it must take place. Those processes God set forward, they must be finished and fulfilled. That includes your deliverance. That too must be fulfilled. That's what you represent. God's completeness. Folks, it is past that time. I'll likely join you guys at midnight. I'm back on back on the uh, cleanup, the cleanup crew. I got to finish the cleanup thing. To those who were hit hard by this hurricane, I'm praying for you. I'm sure that others are praying for you. We can always learn from these things. In that way, it won't go to waste. All too often, these things are not the work of evil. They're not. They can save your life. All you have to do is look for your father's footprints, his fingerprints, his doings in these things. They will help you prepare for the heavier things to come. Because if you are to assist others during a very turbulent time, you must be standing upright yourselves first. If that's your desire, accept the training. Accept it. So this is Brother Mike. We don't take the market. We're going to be put in the camps if we can't pay, and pay our bills. Listen, it takes a very special person to be around during that time. Those who are meant to be alive during that time will most certainly be alive. But if you think you're going to think of things now, the way you're thinking now, you're not going to be thinking then because the Lord will bestow upon you sevenfold something. We haven't talked, discussed this yet, but you'll be given something sevenfold, he said. Sevenfold. So that means how you think right now and the fears you have right now, you will not have once something is bestowed upon you sevenfold. Those things that bother you now will not bother you then. They will not. God works. God always works as things are needed. He doesn't really give us things that we have the comfort of knowing that we have it before going into something. It's a walk of faith. He will supply us as we walk. Remember that. And what he has in store for us is sufficient. It is in balance with everything. As the evil rises, so will the spirit within you. He's not going to leave you, right? He's not going to leave you nor forsake you. Because for you to be overcome by darkness, that would be a forsaking of you. You're not going to be forsaken. He already told you you will be victorious. Hmm? He already told you that. Folks, God bless you. I may see you guys at midnight. Okay? You may do that. God bless all of you. Thank you for your interactions, comments, disputes, and otherwise. All of it's needful. Even the last conversation was needful. There's about 400 people who saw that conversation, and they were blessed by it. It helped them get over the argument mentality. Now, that's some awesome feedback. God bless and keep all of you. I'll see you next time right here at COT.